Hi, this is Scott Bradfield. This is the Ultimate Beginners Workshops in Creative Reading and Writing. Um, we are on our second uh, lecture to discuss uh, Vladimir Nabokov's early novel, Laughter in the Dark, originally published as Camera Obscura. Uh, many, many, he made many interesting changes when he translated it into English with his son uh, many years after he wrote it. We won't discuss those, but what we will try to talk about today is just certain interesting aspects of Nabokov's whole interest in fiction. Um, one of the things we, we've quoted often is his, his uh, assertion that uh, the, the, the three ingredients, or the three skills of a, of a novelist or a fiction writer, the most important one is that of enchantment, to enchant the reader. He takes fiction extremely seriously, and he takes it seriously as a great pleasure and a great, um, almost a, uh, a great game with the reader. He, he, he was, a, as, you, as we've talked about, he was a lepidopterist. He was a, a, a scientist of butterflies. He collected butterflies all his life with great passion and great love. Uh, one of the things that fascinated him about the butterfly was its ability to mimic things. It could look like the sky, it could look like grass, it could look like flowers and trees, and that ability for nature to mimic things always interested Nabokov, and it interests him as a writer. The, the uh, characters that will be floating around in Nabokov novels who you won't quite recognize and maybe not identify the first time you read their novels um, are there to remind us that you need to pay attention to the act of reading is a very active a participant. You're a participant in the fiction, and you are a participant in the pleasure of the fiction. You are not this kind of receiver of of other people's wisdom. You are not this sit you know, sit there humbly listening to the great sages of the world. You are involved in the process of the fiction, and the man who creates the fiction for you, or the woman who creates it for you, is. Is, is organizing the pleasure, and no one organizes it greater than Nabokov. Nabokov, excuse me. Um, he was interested. We talked a little bit about the opening of Laughter, uh, three or four sentences, which tells us the story in a nutshell. The nutshell has no value to Nabokov. It is the details and the texture of the story, which is then spun out over 300 pages that makes it beautiful. So he has and the narrative sentences. We're going to talk about these basic techniques again and again in fiction. All of the techniques of fiction Nabokov uses with extraordinary care. So you'll see that each sentence is a narrative moment in time. It's moving us forward. It develops the first premise and it concludes it all. But just the no-brainer stuff of a story. Stories aren't filled with flashbacks. You know, Goldilocks doesn't go to see the three bears, and then we hear about Goldilocks and how she became Goldilocks. We go into the house where the three bears are. Nabokov is going to take us through um, a number of great novels, and he's going to make us think all the way through them. Now, one of the terms you know that I probably hate, if you've heard me talk before, is the notion of the, the omniscient narrator. Now, I'm... A, one of the frustrating parts about that term is that all, all writers are omniscient when they write their books. The technique of point of view is a technique. It is something that you use to create an illusion of fiction. There is, there is no real, uh, in, in the same way in film, when you watch a movie, you don't imagine, think about all the people with the cameras and the directors and the screenwriters. You pretend you're watching a film, even though there's all that technique out there. Well, that technology is out there. In fiction, it's the same way. So learning the basic techniques of point of view are very important, and to not s slip away into this idea that every time you don't do your job right, you can say, oh, I was doing the omniscient narrator. Every time someone tells me they're doing the omniscient narrator, I think you don't know what you're talking about. Nabokov, however, has a very, very interesting omniscient narrator floating around in the backs of his books. And today I wanted to talk about not that, because that's that'll show up, but the fact that even if you want to admit that there is an omniscient narrator operating in this in this great canvas of, of, of the novel of Laughter in the Dark, most every sentence and most every page 
requires us to believe in this fake mimicry, this, this illusion of point of view. For example, one of, the, one of the most interesting aspects of the book is the appearance of Axel Rex. We, we see Axel in the very beginning of the text, in the beginning of the novel, when Albinus is looking for someone to help him create a film illusion. Illusions are very big in Nabokov, and creating uh, illusions of reality is what he does as a fiction writer, and what he, what he loves about good fiction writers like Tolstoy and Gogol, they create the illusion of reality with great detail. Now, he meets Axel Rex, and we see him about page 10 or 11, just the first few pages of the novel. He's corresponding with Axel, and we get to know Axel through Albinus, and the character sort of disappears. Now, what a boring uh, omniscient narrator would do would be constantly telling us everything that was going on. But we don't have an omniscient narrator explaining things to us. We know what Albinus sees, and then later we know what Margot sees. This is about page 32 of my text, and it's about near the end of chapter 3. A man shows up in Margot's life who has is, who is basically bought her from her landlady, and his comes in and he says, uh, when he first meet him, his name is Miller, or that was the name he gave. Um, unfortunately, it was not, this is page 32, it was not such a simple matter to decide what to make of Miller. This is Margot's point of view. First of all, he had a striking face. His lusterless black hair, carelessly brushed back, longish and with an odd dry look about it, was certainly not a wig, although it looked uncommonly like one. His cheeks seemed hollow because the cheekbones protruded so, and their skin was dull, right, dull white as if coated with a thin layer of powder. His sharp, twinkling eyes and those funny three-cornered nostrils, which made one think of a lynx, were never still for a moment. Not so the heavy lower half of his face with the two motionless furrows at the corners of the mouth. His attire seemed rather foreign. That very blue shirt with a bright blue tie, that dark blue suit with enormously wide trousers. He was tall and slim, and his square shoulders moved splendidly as he picked his way among Frau Lewandowski's plush furniture. Margot had pictured him quite differently, and now she sat there with arms tightly crossed, feeling rather shocked and unhappy, while Miller fairly gobbled her up with his eyes. In a rasping voice, he asked for her name. She told him. And I'm little Axel, he said, with a short laugh, and brusquely turning away from her, he resumed his conversation with Frau Lewandowski. I won't carry this on, but the name Axel kind of drops into that section. The rest of the chapter, he's known as Miller, and we only hear him as Miller, and it's mo most likely the first time you read the text, to read the book, you're not going to recognize the connection between Axel Rex, who becomes this prominent figure in the book, and the man who um, Albinus is corresponding with. Remember this, because Nabokov is not going to tell you what's happening. You have to be there in that person's point of view. You have to be thinking. You've got the privilege of moving around in the text, because because he's taking you around, but at the same time you have to watch out for things. He doesn't explain things, almost ever. One of the great things about a good fiction writer is they don't explain what's happening. They make you in the, part of the experience. Axel will start to show up. We will see this technique of having characters floating around in the text, in the novel, while we're, we're, we're moving through it with great, great beauty in Lolita. And Lolita will have a number of characters wandering around in that book who you will not recognize the first time you read it. Now, I want to go on here. What we do is we often in the text, in the novel, I'm sorry, text is this term I hate. It's from, it's from being teaching academic, academic uh, classes for years. Um, in the novel, what happens is he starts to get involved with her, and then eventually... Eventually, he decides he's going to leave her. Now, we start to go back and forth. Now, notice this. This is not an unusual technique to move from one character in a room then go to the other person's point of view. 
and then to leave the room and then go to another place in another house and see another person's point of view. We go to Paul's point of view, or we go to Albinus's, or we go to um, Margot's. We move around a bit. This is not flagrant, and it's not wild. It's, it's very well controlled. But he does a little trick here at the, um, and, and the importance of point of view is always, always maintained by Nabokov. He doesn't tell us everything that's happening because the beauty would all be gone. Look at page 36. It's when he decides to leave her. He doesn't want to leave her, but he decides he's going to leave her. And when he tells her he's going, she asks him, how much, how, when are you coming back? How long are you going to be gone? This is page 37 of my, my, my copy, and it's near the end of uh, chapter 3. How long are you going to be gone? Forever, I guess, he said suddenly. And he began to dress without looking at her. She thought that he might be joking, kicked off the bedclothes, as the room was very hot, and turned her face to the wall. We're with Margot now. We were without, we were without with Axel a few minutes ago, but now we're with Margot. We're going to stay with her. Pity I haven't a photo of you, he said, as he stamped into his shoes. She can hear that. Then she heard him pack and lock the small suitcase he used for the odds and ends he brought to the flat. After a few minutes, he said, Don't move and don't look round. She did not stir. What was he doing? She twitched her bare shoulder. Don't move, he repeated. For a couple of minutes, there was silence except for a faint, grating sound which somehow seemed familiar. Now you may turn he said. But Margot still lay motionless. He walked up to her, kissed her ear, and went out quickly. The kiss sang in her ear for quite a while. She lay in bed the whole day. He never came back. Now, this is one of the many times you'll see in the, in the novel where he will make a commitment to stay with somebody, and it's important because we only know what Margot knows in that scene, and she hears him kiss she hears that kiss in her ear, and he leaves. And then when they come back together uh, several months later, he shows her the picture he drew with the back of her neck. Now, that's a lovely, perfect Nabokov moment. There's, a, there's that, that interest that he has in her and turning her into a cartoon. He's a cartoonist, by the way. You couldn't, Nabokov's loathing for Axel Rex is just, is, is palpable throughout the book. He's, he's a cartoonist, and he's drawing cartoons of all these people, and, and treating them terribly. And the hoax, he likes to hoax people. We have to think about that very, very crucially in, in, in Nabokov. But when she leaves, we have it all from her point of view. He doesn't explain what's happening. And then later, when they come together, we find it out. He takes his time. He keeps us in the characters' heads. And even when you have this nebulous, interesting notion of an omniscient narrator floating around in all of Nabokov's major books, the omniscient narrator is an insidious presence that Nabokov has pretty well defined. It's not just, I was too lazy to do my point of view correctly, so I'm calling it omniscient. It's a very, very controlled device for Nabokov. Most of the time, the illusion of fiction is maintained by these clear, direct visions of the world through one character's eyes. And Nabokov never wastes a moment to use those points of view and maintain them because they make the fiction work for us. Okay, I'm going to just leave it at that. And next week we will talk a little bit more of the kind of the magician, the enchantment, the enchantment of Nabokov and the deliberate notion of kind of playing games with the reader and fooling them because, of course, as, as Albinus, we're being fooled horribly by Axel, and we have to think about the Nabokovian uh, presence out there manufacturing these great, complicated novels. Okay, thanks a lot. We'll see you next in, at the next lecture. Bye.